Well, hello to you all and welcome. I'm Bill Glasgow at the Volcker Alliance, and this is Special Briefing. I'm here with our co-host, Susan Walker of the Penn Institute for Urban Research. Hi, Susan. Good morning, Bill. How are you doing? Good. Anxious to hear whether public pensions are still in crisis, our topic of today. Darn right. And it's a great topic. And, and we're going to be focusing on the health and investing strategies of America's state and local pension systems. Some background for you. With $4 trillion in assets, that's about equal to the whole muni bond market. Pensions are a vital source of retirement income security for many of the nation's 20 million teachers, cops, firefighters, and others who have chosen state and local public service for their careers. Thank you, by the way, uh, for your great service. And since the Great Recession, we've heard lots of doomsday scenarios about governments not salting away enough to cover benefits that they promised to their workers. But as the economy picked up steam toward the end of the last decade and continued to grow after the pandemic interruption, many states and cities have bolstered their contributions to retirement systems enough to make meaningful improvements. And that's meant some interesting choices between pension, pension contributions and perhaps infrastructure or, or salaries uh, it's something that uh, Liz Farmer later on will we'll come back and discuss. So right now, states and localities still owe about $1 trillion for retirement income benefits that they promised, but they haven't yet funded. To put that number in context of what this means in terms of public spending, $1 trillion would pay the annual salaries of almost 2 million school teachers or build 400 airport terminals like the new uh, Terminal A at, at Newark that many of you might have gone through over Thanksgiving. So is it time to say the pension crisis is over? Like, like Susan asked, uh, are we past this or not? I'm not going to give you the answer right now, but we have a terrific panel to discuss this critical question today, starting with Shoaib Khan, Director and Chief Investment Officer at the New Jersey Division of Investment. Next, we'll hear from Anthony Rondazzo, Executive Director of the Equable Institute, which does pension research. From the view uh, from Wall Street, please welcome Fidanta Goinka, Lead Strategist in the Muni Division at City. From the Bluegrass State comes my friend Merle Hackbart, Professor Emeritus at the Martin School at University of Kentucky and member of the state's Public Pension Authority Board. Following him will be Les Richmond, Vice President and Pension Actuary at Build America Mutual. And for the last word, Liz Farmer, fiscal policy expert, journalist, and co-host of the Public Money Podcast. A warm welcome to you all. Before we start, a few words. We're coming to you on the Volcker Alliance and Penn IUR websites, and also on the Special Briefing Podcast. We've taken your questions in advance, and we'll get to them in the second half. And of course, this Special Briefing is made possible with the support of the Volcker Alliance, members of the Penn IUR Board of Advisors, and the Century Foundation. And now on to pensions. New Jersey is one of the states that have in recent years really knuckled down and boosted taxpayers' contributions to improve the health of state pensions. What happens when those contributions hit the pension coffers? That's the business of our leadoff panelist today, Shoaib Khan. We're honored to have you here today to tell us all about how you're navigating the new interest rate environment and the opportunities that this presents. Mr. Khan, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Bill. Uh, good morning, everyone. It's, it's it's very nice to be with you today. So um, to provide uh, some, some background, the New Jersey Division of Investment is the group within the state that is responsible for managing pension assets. So uh, in fact, I would say it's, 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 that's our primary focus day in and day out, as there is a separate division which manages activities that are related to the administration of pension benefits. The division manages approximately 90 billion in pension assets and approximately 40 billion in a separate uh, cash management fund, which is effectively a short-term investment vehicle for the state as well as uh, several other entities in an, uh, uh, in the state of New Jersey. Um, in terms of how we, how we manage those assets, we currently uh, do this with approximately 60 team members, which include investment as well as non-investment uh, staff. The bulk of our assets are internally managed 
uh, with a team in, 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 in which we have uh, great and, and high confidence in. Uh, that being said, uh, we do manage a fair amount of capital and investments through advisors as well as investment managers as, uh, 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 and in several different asset classes. In fact, the division invests uh, ac across, and I would say, most major asset classes, which include public equities, public fixed income, uh, and of course, those include the various subclassifications, such as emerging markets or non-US developed markets on the public equity side, as well as treasuries, uh, investment grade, and high yield on the fixed income side. The division also invests in private market asset classes, including private equity, private credit, real estate, real assets, and risk mitigation strategies, which include uh, allocations to some hedge funds as well. We have a target of approximately 30% of the portfolio to alternative asset classes. Those targets over the, the last several years have been increasing. And I think you've seen that across uh, several pension plans as well. And, and, and it seems to be a, a, a trend and a movement towards uh, diversifying portfolios uh, with the inclusion of the, the various alternative asset classes that uh, comprise that. So uh, while, when, and, and in terms of how much is allocated to which asset classes, of course, the in State Investment Council is the governing body uh, for the Division of Investment. Uh, it, it establishes, is responsible for establishing and does establish the asset allocation targets. However, they do allow the division the ability to shift assets to, um, uh, you know, on a tactical basis to address uh, and take advantages uh, or take advantage rather of opportunities uh, in, in the market, as well as to uh, specifically address market challenges. And of course, we certainly are seeing some uh, market challenges in, in the current environment. So an example of, of tactical allocation, I would just say that, uh, you know, uh, we recently uh, are in the process of finishing and, and, and preparing the, the financial reports for fiscal year 2023. And, and as we look at that, you know, the, the allocation target for capital cash and cash equivalents uh, for during fiscal year 2023, ending June 30th, uh, was 4%. However, during the year, we carried approximately 7 to 8% in cash and cash equivalents, which, of course, managing a cash management fund, uh, we, we, we manage that internally, of course, reducing uh, costs through, through that mechanism. Uh, but this, this allocation is an example of tactical moves, if you will, to, to address concerns. And it, it really is a reflect uh, is reflective, I would say, of concerns at that time, we, you know, uh, during sort of early 2022, when we had Russia and Ukraine and, 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 and geopolitical events. So it is, it is where, where we started to reduce some market exposure and increasing some uh, protection uh, strategies within the portfolio. So it's a reflective of uh, reflective of, of those concerns. In addition to that, of course, uh, uh, we it is reflective. More importantly, I would say of the potential and and current returns that we are seeing from cash in a rising interest rate environment. So it is a combination of both addressing challenges, I would say, uh, or potential challenges on the horizon, as well as taking advantage of opportunities. And certainly when we can, when, when we feel that, look, when we can generate uh, approximately five and a half percent uh, from cash and cash equivalents, uh, from a risk reward perspective, that's quite favorable, especially when our long term asset uh, or I'm sorry, long term um, uh, um, assumed rate of return uh, is is at 7%. So when you're about 150, 160 basis points away from that in a uh, cash in an asset class similar to uh, such as cash, it generates a, a quite favorable risk return profile. The other comment I would make, and this is uh, this is no different from from various other public pension plans, and uh, is that New Jersey has also seen uh, an increase in allocation targets towards uh, private market asset classes. There are obviously a number of benefits uh, that come with that, along with it with its challenges. The objective here is to, of course, diversify diversify the portfolio even further and take advantage of interesting uh, market opportunities, interesting investment strategies, uh, as well as generate additional returns from the illiquidity premium, which should accompany private market asset classes. And that's that's upon us to make sure that the return is commensurate with the, the risk that, that we are, are undertaking there. Of course, that does, yeah, it doesn't come without risks. 
uh, and, and additional risks. I, and I, very, very few things come with, with without risk, of course, but private market asset classes bring in additional risk. And so the, the close monitoring and, and, and that includes uh, illiquidity and watching illiquidity very closely needs to take place. This is one of the reasons we do not rush out to allocate too quickly in order to just meet our asset allocation targets, uh, which of course, being a pension plan, they are long-term targets. We're a pension plan. We have long-term assets and long-term liabilities. So I'll pause there for, and then, uh, of course, happy to answer any questions that come up. Well, thanks very much, Shoaib. And we're going to return to the issue of, of alternative uh, alternative assets in pensions. We have a bunch of questions on that. Uh, but right now, let's turn to Anthony Rondazzo uh, from Equable to talk about where we are on, on funding and what's the good news and what's the bad news. Uh, thanks, Bill and Susan, for the invite. So our top assessment from a 50-state review of data is that funding strategies for public plans have significantly improved, whether we look at the last five years or the last 15 years. Um, however, the net effect of those strategies has mainly been to prevent, say, a potential funding crisis from developing or getting worse, depending on your point of view. Um, it hasn't significantly moved the needle on funded status, uh, whether we're looking at the national average of funded ratios or unfunded liability levels. Um, and you know, whether we're looking at the funded status from state and local pension funds in 2022, which was around 75%, or our estimate for 2023, which is a funded ratio is around 78%, th those funded ratios are still well below the 92, 82% funded ratios we were seeing in 2007 and 2008 for the financial crisis. And unfunded liability dollars today are still higher than they um, were um, in the financial crisis. So we're seeing this um, improvement, slight improvement, but there are still headwinds. And so the major reason why we think that public plans are not where we would like to see them after having experienced the huge bull markets um, between 2009 and, and 2020, um, the major reasons we think um, are related to how the sources of unfunded liabilities um, are changing and what are the major contributors to what we, you know, what you might notionally call pension debt today. I'll detail those out, but um, before that, just for those of you who are unfamiliar with Equable, we're a national nonprofit that's focused on the intersection of public sector retirement systems and other major public policy issues. Um, and uh, the late Dick Ravage, obviously very important to this program, was one of our founding board members. Um, our team collects valuation reports, um, ACFRS board materials from the top 225 state and municipal defined benefit plans. Um, those collectively are about 95% of all accrued liabilities for public plans nationwide. So the data that I'm about to sort of walk through in the numbers, they are using those plans reported funded status data, using their own actuarial assumptions, their funding methods. Um, and then if I mention an estimate figure, that's coming from our own roll forward model and asset projection um, data using reported investment returns. So what does the data say? Uh, so there's two decidedly positive trends, whether we're looking at the last 14 to 15 years, and that is plans today are now paying 100% of actuarially required contributions. Um, and the second sort of positive trend is that states are using budget surpluses to make supplemental contributions on top of those contributions to buy down unfunded liabilities. Those are two very significant trends. Um, we were notably concerned in 2020 whether or not states would revert to the same behaviors that they had in, 20, in 2009, 2010, 2011, where they were not paying as much of the required contributions following the financial crisis. There were a couple states that made some slight things on this, but for the most part, we didn't see any of that. There's been a very strong commitment, and I think realization amongst most legislators and gover um, governor's offices that it is important to do what you can to hit 100% of your ADAC. Um, New Jersey has actually been a standout of these um, in terms of their funding strategies of all states. Um, they have the highest improvement in their funded ratio between 2019 and our estimates for 2023. Um, Connecticut, historically also not a great actor, um, the third best improvement between 2019 and 2023. And in both cases, it has been either an increased commitment or in New Jersey's case, finally a commitment to trying to get to 100% ADEC um, or supplemental contributions, which Connecticut's actually been a leader in. And then states with fixed contribution rates um, have also been trying to ramp those up. Texas um, and Colorado are two notable examples of this. 
Um, now, all of this has helped get more money into plans, and that's nudged funded ratios from a bottom of 2009 of 62% funded to the mid to high 70% funded ratios today. Those are not sufficient goals, uh, particularly after nearly a decade and a half, that kind of improvement is fairly mediocre. And particularly given that we've seen the average employer contribution grow from 17% of payroll in 2009 to over 30% of payroll as of uh, this current fiscal year um, or the 2023 fiscal year. Um, now it's worth noting there's heterogeneity um, among state and local plan funded status. Some plans are doing a great job. Some states are doing a great job. Others are below the average. But the key reason that the national funded status figures have not improved is that um, there had been a change in what causes unfunded liabilities. So um, in the late 1990s, there were plan most plans were re uh, reaching full funded status. 2001 plans were fully funded. A bunch of plans expanded benefits um, at that time. And then over the following 10 to 15 years, um, the major contributor to unfunded liability was underperforming assumed rates of return. But when you break down the actuarial gain loss data, if you look at the data from year to year of what plan actuaries report or the specific contributors to unfunded liabilities going up or down, since 2015, um, we are seeing less underperforming um, investment returns as a contributor and more changes to assumptions as a major contributor. So this is changes to the assumed rate of return. Um, a little bit of it is changes to actuarial methods or mortality tables, but it looks like the bulk of it is because the average assumed rate of return has gone from 8% 2008 to 7.25% in 2018. It's down to 9% or 6.9% as of 2023. It's going to keep falling. Um, the you know that that sort of shift is is reflective of changes in financial markets, changes in perspectives of what returns plans can actually get. And we don't really see that that's going to change in the next couple of years. We think that plans are just going to get a little even more conservative or maybe more rational with respect to what they can actually achieve in the market as states are willing to actually provide funding. The New York Common Fund has been a leader in terms of best practice on this. They're assuming a 5.9% rate of return, right? It's the third largest pension fund by assets in the country is assuming 5.9% near common. Um, that's where we see things trending to. But only 40 of the top 225 plans are using assumed rates of return at 6.5 or less. So we see there's going to be, we see a lot more movement coming on this. And that's going to put downward pressure on funded ratios, even as contributions ramp up into them. Last thing I'll say on this, um, is the two other headwinds we think could keep funded ratios from significant improvement um, over the next decade, um, even if contributions go up, the two of them are negative cash flow. So negative cash flow is increasing every year as plans mature. The last two years, there's been $100 billion um, more flowing out in benefits than coming in in contributions nationally. Um, that would be fine if public plans are fully funded but they're not. <laughs> and so increasing liquidity needs are going to uh, increasingly influence investment strategies. And then the other, um, the third sort of headwind we see is the emerging threat of valuation risk for reported assets. So for most of the history, pension funds, reporting asset values has not really been a major area of focus. Most assets were either marked to market or they market value, or they weren't, you know, alternatives weren't a large share of portfolios. But as we're talking today, Private capital, that accounts for 13% of public plan portfolios. Real estate is approaching 10%. And so without saying positive or negative things about either one of those strategies, just treating that as neutral, what we do know is that those values are not necessarily market priced. They are subject to considerable swings in valuations as we've seen over the last three years. And so that means that there's a risk with so much uh, public plan assets being priced with valuations and those asset values contributing to unfunded liability numbers and then that determining contribution rates, that there's this risk of valuations being mispriced and that having a downstream influence on unfunded liabilities. So funder ratios have improved from the bottom of 2009 thanks to improved funding strategies, but there are a few headwinds that we think suggest that this is not an unmitigated recovery going forward. Well, thanks so much, Anthony. Sorry, I was unmuting myself for, for a second. That's the uh, the hazards of Zoom. Uh, we're going to turn now to the trading floor, live on the trading floor at 
at at City in Lower Manhattan uh, to hear from Vedanta Gonka, and I'm going to sort of uh, preface some of the some of the questions. Uh, we've heard something about investment strategy, about risk, and about funding improvement. Um, how, is this improvement uh, really being fully reflected in in mini bond prices, or in the words of Roddy Dangerfield, uh, why don't they get no respect? Uh, uh, thanks for having me here, Bill. I guess let me just talk about pensions, and then I'll talk about some of the improvements, and then I'll uh, I guess I'll address your question, right? So as far as uh, pension funding is concerned, we've, as Anthony mentioned, seen a tremendous improvement in ratios since pre-pandemic. We've seen ratios rising from say 71% in 2019 to currently around 80% as of today. And this improvement has occurred on the back of strong investment returns, as well as judicious use of the federal pandemic aid by state and local governments. In terms of investment returns, uh, we saw that on average, state and local uh, government, the pension plans saw 27% returns in 2021. They were negative 6% in 2022. And 2023, after the November rally, they're shaping up to be fairly positive for pension assets as well. And I guess what I'd also like to highlight is that the states like Illinois, New Jersey, Kentucky, that suffer from the worst pension funded uh, programs have seen some of the maximum improvement. And they've benefited not only from the investment returns, but they've also implemented policy that addresses some of the challenges. So for example, Illinois has implemented a tiered pension system, which, reduce, uh, which reduces state costs. Uh, they've made supplemental pension contributions. Louisiana, whose pension funded ratio is in the low 70s, also passed a constitutional amendment just this past October, which requires 25% a minimum of non-recurring state revenue to be appropriated for pension funding starting in 2024. But going forward, we see that there's going to be some pressure on pension funded ratios. Uh, they've come on the back of improved uh, state and local government revenue, but now we're seeing some evidence that the tax revenues are going to be less than what they're expecting. Uh, New, New York, for example, is expecting 2024 tax revenues to be 10 billion below what they expected from previous year. California is seeing reduced tax collections starting from October. And if this becomes a nation, national trend, we could see pension contributions drop off as the tax collections underwhelm. And moreover, as the pandemic federal aid also dries up, we could see the pension contributions not match up to what is expected right now, I guess. Uh, the other large uh, concern, I think this is something that Anthony also mentioned, is, uh, is that we've seen pension assets increase their reliance on riskier assets, and that may be subject to valuation risk. Uh, since 2010, we've seen the proportion of fixed income assets in pension uh, plans drop from 28% or so in 2010 to around 20% or so now. And this decline has been offset by an increase in alternative assets, which are inherently riskier. The other uh, worrying trend and is that the, the pension plans, which are the lowest funded, have increased the allocation to the alternative risky assets the most, right? And as Anthony mentioned, that there is some valuation risk involved. So these assets are not marked to market. And if you look at, for example, real estate with mortgage rates at 8%, we're continuing to see, I mean, no uh, activity in the existing homes, but we're continuing to see that the marginal buyer driving the, the, the home prices up, right? So how long is this sustainable? Are the pension assets even valued if they were to be marked to market? Is the pension funded ratios accurate or not? I mean, that is subject to question as well, right? And this is in incredibly important as to the municipal market because I mean, rating agencies certainly look at pension um, funded ratios and their liabilities as one of the important drivers for ratings. Uh, I think Moody's, I mean, 20% of the ratings are co comes from the long-term liabilities of which pension um, liabilities make up a bulk of it. And I mean, in the recent rating actions like Illinois, Chicago, pension uh, improvement was cited as some of the major reasons for, I guess, improvement, right? Um, coming to questions, I think it, it certainly has an important impact. The way I look at uh, uh, the funded ratios is that if you have some states which have 
really positive pension funding ratios, like for example, California or New York, whether they improve significantly or deteriorate slightly, it doesn't have an impact on credit spreads as much. But when you look at some of the lowest funded uh, states, then um, I guess the funded, uh, pension funded ratios matter a lot more and it weighs on credit spreads and credit costs as well, which increase the cost to capital for the, the state and local governments. Well, thank well, that's, you. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, sorry about that, Susan. I was just going to do the our little uh, our little bumper here. Uh, oh, this is special briefing from the Volcker Alliance and Penn IUR. All, all you in the in the room know that, but uh, uh, we like to we like to remind you the archived editions of all the special briefs, including this one, are on our websites and the special briefing podcast. And uh, now let's get back to pensions. And Susan, uh, yes, over to you thank, to introduce thank, our thank next you for guest. That, Bill. And thank you so much for Danta. That was terrific. And for and for each of the previous panelists, excellent setup. And we are now going to turn to Meryl Hockbart, who is Professor Emeritus of the Martin School of Public Policy and Administration at the University of Kentucky, and who's going to be able to take us back and give us some perspective on uh, thinking through how states are thinking about their pension uh, responsibilities and how best to respond in this uncertain environment and what they've accomplished so far. Please go ahead, Merle. Well, thank you for asking me to join this panel and to participate in this discussion of a very important and timely topic regarding whether public pension funds are still in crises. The financial status of public pension plans has been a concern of state and local governments and nonprofit organizations and public officials for a, the last couple of decades. The concern was increased by the pension system financial losses associated with the Great Recession of 2008-2009. The losses incurred significantly reduced, as we've heard from other panelists, the funding ratio of state and local governments to a low around 65% in that period. However, since the recession, all states' average funding ratios have been increased to around 75%, as we've discussed already this, after, this, this morning. It is noted also, as was suggested, that the 65 or so percentage ratio followed a period earlier in that decade where the national funding ratio was an 80% range. And we also point, so it was also pointed out that most state funds were, were funded above 100% prior to 2000, 2001. The Great Recession wasn't the only reason for, for the perceived public pension crisis of the past decade, but is probably the, the major factor. Other factors, such as the overly optimistic return expectations and the associated actuarial assessments preceding the recession and failure to fund the actuarially required pension fund contribution, as well as decisions by pension boards, legislatures, city councils, and pension system administrators also contributed to the status of the plans in the last couple of decades. <clears throat> A major factor in the improved financing ratios has been the full funding of the actuarially required contribution by state and local governments. Full funding, of course, includes both the normal contribution as well as the supplemental contributions needed to offset the previous failure to meet normal funding requirements or the amortized underfunded actuarially accrued liability or also referred to as the UAAL. Of course, the funding ratios have also been benefited by favorable investment returns. Given the adjustment that states and local governments have made to their pension systems in response to pension system concerns, such as adjusting benefits, supplemental funding, and ensuring contributions are meeting their requirements, has demonstrated a commitment to take actions to ensure the sustainability of pension systems. Given that demonstrated commitment it is probably an overstatement to characterize the pension system status currently as being in crisis. Rather, ensuring the viability and sustainability of public pension systems may be best characterized as being a manageable challenge. In reality, manageable challenge probably describes most public programs, including Social Security, Medicaid or Medicare, and other programs such as those implemented to deal in response to climate change, deteriorating infrastructure, and life. Like other programs, public pension systems represent long-term commitments by governments to their citizens and employees, 
and the pension systems must be continually monitored, assessed, and adjusted to ensure that they provide the benefits promised when the systems were created and employees joined the public sector workforce. A reasonable short-term goal for pension system policy managers and, and, and operators is to ensure that the net difference between cash inflow from employers, employees, and investment income compared to outflows is to retirees is positive. With overall net positive cash flows, gradual improvements in the funding ratio and system sustainability can be achieved. Meaning the manageable challenge of ensuring the long-term sustainability of public pension systems can be met by focusing on five major shared responsibilities. The first responsibility of effectively managing the ongoing system, including continually monitoring and managing system net cash flows and ensuring that required funds from employers, employees, and income received from received to retired benefits is appropriately dispersed. The second responsibility is of assessing the long-term financial status of pension systems via economic and actuarial assessments and reacting to those outlooks by adjusting funding and pension policies accordingly. The responsibility of managing the pension system's portfolio to ensure the system's ability to meet liquidity needs, particularly during periods of economic and with the financial fluctuation is an additional responsibility. Fourthly, the responsibility to manage the pension system's asset allocation policy in a manner consistent with the system's funding status and in a manner which reflects appropriate risk and return trade-offs. And finally, the responsibility to manage the investment decisions and, per and performance of fund managers who have been contract to help assist in the system's operation. If pension system policymakers, boards, and system managers focus on carrying out these responsibilities, these five responsibilities, it will help ensure that their system is able to meet the unknown and certainly realizable manageable challenges that their system will face in the future and surely face in the future. And this also ensure that their pension system has a financial capacity to meet beneficiary commitments while avoiding a future pension system crises. Thank you. Thank you so much, Merle. Not in crisis, but a manageable challenge and for those five areas of focus. And now uh, it is our pleasure to turn to our next speaker, who is Leo Richmond. Vice yes. uh, I'm sorry, Les, excuse me, Les <laughs> Richmond, apologize. Les Richmond, of course, Vice President and Actuary of Build America Mutual. And uh, Les will give us his perspective on his perspective on nationwide pension trends and pension risk. Les, please go ahead. Thanks, Susan, and thanks everyone for having me today. Uh, my employer, Build America Mutual, is a municipal bond insurer, which means that if we insure a bond, we have an irrevocable commitment to step in and pay debt service if the bond issuer cannot. And my role in the uh, process for when we uh, analyze uh, whether to offer insurance on a bond is to study pension risk. Um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to talk about uh, some national pension trends and how we think about them in terms of pension risk. So first, let's define pension risk. That's the risk that uh, pension and other post-employment benefit costs can rise to such a degree during the time we insure a bond uh, that they can impair an issuer's ability to pay their debts. And if you're getting to that point, you're probably also uh, having trouble offering services to taxpayers. So uh, we, we're studying pension risk. So uh, other panelists have talked about um, Funded ratios, uh, yes, funded ratios have improved in recent years. Uh, Merle mentioned that around the turn of the century, uh, pension plans were around 100% funded. So uh, at 75 or 78% funded, uh, that's still a relatively low percentage by historical standards. And uh, what that means is it follows that um, the budgetary requirements to pay for pensions are relatively high by historical standards, which of course, high budgetary requirements would be uh, represent an elevated uh, pension risk. 
Uh, one of the things that we uh, think about a lot at BAM is uh, funding adequacy. So uh, as Anthony mentioned, uh, uh, employers have been paying, uh, have elevated their pension contributions to 100% of the actuarially determined contribution uh, on average. That's a very good thing. Uh, however, when we think about pension risk, we think about what do these pension contributions do to pay down unfunded liabilities? And so... Um, a lot, uh, in my experience, uh, even now, uh, a lot of pension systems are still what we call in neg negative amortization territory, which means that the contributions themselves are so low that they actually allow unfunded liabilities to rise from beginning to end of year. So that's a high risk situation, uh, allowing the situation to deteriorate just because the contributions are too low. Uh, we think about the willingness and ability to enact pension reforms. You know, if you're going to address unfunded pension liabilities, there are two ways to approach it. One is to raise your assets, so improve your pension contributions. Another way is to lower liabilities. So what is the, what is, what's the willingness and ability to actually do that, enact reforms? Well, since the Great Recession, almost all states have enacted some type of reform uh, to reduce liabilities. That's a good thing. Um, when... Um, uh, when I right now, I would say my radar is really up for some of the economic situations that are occurring right now, which uh, namely a tight labor market and a higher inflation um, environment that we're in. So those two things combined, uh, it's possible that there could be demands for higher wages, which you know most pension benefits are related to wages, so that could increase liabilities and uh, and therefore risk. Um, there could be in a higher inflation environment, there could be a call by retirees, uh, especially in plans that provide only ad hoc cost of living adjustments to retirees to uh, enact COLAs. Um, and of course, that's an unfunded brand new liability that would increase pension risk. And lastly, on inflation, I would say uh, that feeds into higher health care costs. We haven't really talked too much about other post-employment benefits, which is usually retiree health. Uh, but a higher inflation environment could re result in higher health care costs and raise your OPEB liabilities. Now, we're talking about uh, investment risk. Uh, BAM doesn't uh, drill down to you know, individual investments. Okay, We look at what the asset allocation is. And uh, in our assessment, we regard equities and alternative investments as uh, riskier type assets. So we look at the sum of those things uh, in the pension trust portfolio. Now, since, uh, and I'm gonna base this on some public fund survey from the uh, National Association of State, State Retirement Administrators, but uh, in 2005, uh, the sum of those two asset classes nationally was roughly 65% of the portfolio. That has risen to uh, about 69% nowadays, uh, could be slightly higher. Uh, so that's a very slight increase. And you think, well, that's not much of a, much of a deal. So let's just keep that in mind for a second. Uh, let's talk about demographics. Um, since 2005, uh, there were about 2.17 actives for every retiree in a pension fund. Uh, and pension plan population, and that's decreased to 1.25 uh, actives for every reti every retiree uh, in 22, FY22. So you could say that demographically, plan populations are aging, right? Because higher percentages of the population are related to retirees, but at the same time, plan sponsors are increasing risk, which sort of goes against the uh, you know, traditional wisdom that you take risk off the table as as a population or an individual ages. Um, other effects of demographics um, it are, well, you know, if, if the funding policy is not adequate, uh, a sound actuarial funding policy will provide that assets are accumulated while an employee works during their active employment, and then there's enough assets to provide for their pension benefits when they retire. Well, that is not always the case. So when you have uh, a high pension contribution, uh, it's possible that you're not only paying for current active employee benefits, but also for retiree benefits that should have been paid for while they were working. Um, so um, 
you know, retirees are also the hardest group for which to enact pension reforms if you're going to uh, try to affect plan liabilities. So um, the last thing I'll just say is, you know, we're, this is one part of, of a much larger analysis. Um, and so if, in the answer to the question, are pensions still in crisis? The answer for us is, well, it depends. You know, there are some uh, employers, uh, state and local governments that can afford to pay higher pension costs. And we look at those factors, you know, what are, you know, how does this all relate to their overall finances and can they, can, can employers pay for these costs? Um, so you might have neighboring towns that have very similar pension profiles. One is carrying a high amount of debt, one is carrying a little amount of debt. Uh, I would say the one with a little amount of debt is in much better shape. So um, uh, it calls for granular analysis. If you're going to answer the question of if, if pensions are still in crisis. With that, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Les, for that uh, picture and for the importance of the granular understanding of this competitive uh, urban framework that we face in this country. And to help us um, understand that, we now turn to Liz Farmer, who is a leading journalist on urban fiscal policy. Liz? Thanks for having me. Uh, we've heard a lot, I think, a lot of statistics from all of the panelists about the state of pensions and how things have changed. Um, and so I, I think because of all of all of those things, I mean, pensions are arguably the healthiest that they have been since before the Great Recession. I think that's kind of one of the big takeaways that we've heard so far. Um, and that that notion led me to to kind of look at this and, and write a story because I, I started wondering, is it time to stop worrying about about pensions? And what I found is, is as always with pensions, the answer is yes and no. <laughs> I mean, like they say in real estate, it's all about location. Um, broadly speaking, yes, pension health has dramatically improved since the, since the Great Recession. Um, and, but what um, and and a few other additional points that haven't been brought up yet in regards to that, um, the future liability growth because of all those pension forms has been tamed, and I think that's a positive going forward. That's uh, that um, we haven't haven't yet talked about. Um, the the payments are more realistic because of those actuarial assumptions having having uh, having changed, particularly that assumed investment rate of return going down on average. A couple of places, New Jersey was mentioned, Connecticut was mentioned. To me, those are some of the big pension turnaround stories of the last decade. They both uh, they were both the poster childs, along, along with Illinois, uh, for you know what not to do with your pension system. And and uh, reporters like me tended to to beat up on them quite a bit for their lack of funding. New Jersey was sued in 2010 by, if anyone remembers that, by the SEC for not disclosing its pension liabilities accurately to investors. And now a little over a decade later, it's been upgraded. It's It has the first credit rating upgrade in 30 years. Connecticut got its first credit rating upgrade in 30 years. And in part, in both places, that was partly due to them getting a handle on their long-term liabilities. Um, they certainly have a long way to go. But I think if you're going to look at, at at an example of um, what has happened with pensions over the last decade, those are those are two really good examples. Another sign to me that that pensions are kind of um, I don't want to say slipping out of the radar, but are are not a huge concern for a lot of people anymore, is the fact that uh, Hilltop Securities does uh, does this annual survey of um, of municipal bond analysts. Public, public pensions were the number one issue back in 2019. They tended, it, and it tended to be around the top as, um, for a number of years, but public pensions slipped to number four last year. And so again, it's it's not top of mind anymore. It's 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 around, but it's there are other more pressing concerns. So, um, and and I think that's an to to me from what I from what I hear from people that's that's it's pretty accurate. I mean, there yes, in some places there they are still very much a concern, particularly when we're talking about local pensions. I'm writing about a city in Chester, Pen, uh, about the city of Chester, Pennsylvania, which is going through bankruptcy right now, and it's they aren't even a hundred percent sure what their unfunded liabilities are at this point because the accounting and the finances is still uh, they're they're kind of uncovering that mystery still. 
And, and, you know, that's, that's one extreme Chicago also, uh, you know, it's, it's not out of the woods by any means. And the public pensions are eating a, up a larger chunk of that city's budget. They are running a, a, a contest now uh, with the University of Chicago um, to basically kind of crowdsource ideas, new and innovative ideas for, um, for helping out that city's pension that, that haven't been tried yet. So in a lot of places, it's still very much an issue. But um, in terms of the national conversation, pensions have definitely kind of um, taken a step back. Um, I will note, though, that there are a couple of upcoming things that could add pressure. Uh, some of them have already been mentioned regarding the investment, uh, the asset investments in in alternative assets that makes pension as overall assets more volatile. Um, the stock market itself has been more volatile over the last decade or so. So all of those things are, are intertwined. Um, the, there's budget shortfalls already in, at state at the state level. It's going to be a big issue this upcoming legislative session. And while I think lawmakers, you know, that institutional memory of the Great Recession is still very much there in state legislatures. Lawmakers have learned their lessons um, about what not to do with pensions and what what not to do with with one time money as well. Um, there's still very much it's going to be a temptation, I expect, in the next year or so with regards to that that pen, those pension payments are eating up larger, larger sum of the annual operating budget. And as lawmakers are looking to make cuts, it's it's always an option, you know. So that's that's something that I think may come up in, in certain places. Um, and and again, uh, there's a sub issue in some places as well with regards to pressure from state legislatures, and that would be this the divestment pressure from in certain places uh, to divest from ESG investments that came up in Indiana this past year. Uh, the first version of that bill, uh, it was estimated, would have ultimately cost the Indiana pension system it, as a result of divesting from certain. Um, certain investments, uh, a loss of $6.7 billion. They revised the bill, but it still wound up, uh, it's predicted to to cost the state pension system $5.5 million over the next decade. It's so a, a big drop, but it's still a loss that is uh, that is being imposed by the state legislature. So those are some things that I think we should just be keeping an eye on, as well as has already been mentioned, the retiree health care benefits. For the for as long as I've been reporting on pensions, people have been pointing to OPEB as saying that's the next shoe to drop. And I don't think it's dropped yet, but I think we are a lot closer right now because pensions have 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 kind of taken a little bit of a backseat. I think that retiree health care is, is going to be moving up in the conversation. Thank you so much, Liz. I have one um, overarching question before turning it to Bill for all of your questions. And that is for all of the panelists who care to respond and Perhaps you go in order and show up. Perhaps you can start, which is, this is the question. Liz says there is dramatic improvement We and we're not in crisis. We're in a challenge, manageable challenge. Well, why? What is it that has brought us to this better place? Is it more transparency? Is it uh, public pressure? Pressure from insurers, for example, and others? How did this improvement occur? And it wasn't just by accident, it appears. It was by direct action and good action. Joab, can we start with you quickly? Yeah, absolutely, Susan. So, absolutely, Susan. Excellent question. <laughs> and, and and certainly, uh, look, it, it has a, happened over a long period of time, right? So I think it's a recognition of the problem and then a, a an, an objective, a, a dedicated focus to trying to solve it. So what I'll try to do is uh, with my with my answer, try to focus on the investments because leaving aside, you know, the, the all, all the all the things that we talked about with funding and then so forth today, because I think that's a different discussion in terms of how those decisions are made. And I think Liz touched on and others touched on a number of those. I, I will say one thing, and then and, and, and to Liz's point, is the time to worry gone now is it top of mind well i can i, I want to tell your audience and and, and, and and listeners today in my role that's never going to happen because obviously that's what we do all day and every day right so it's always at the top of our of, of our mind it's a worry that will remain every day and it's something that we focus on every and that's day. that's a good thing and that's part yeah. of the story of improvement Absolutely. i'm sure anthony uh, I think the main thing that happened was that the there was a maturing way of thinking about defined benefit plans as it interacted with a sort of 
holistic change in our perspective of how financial markets are going to react with state governments coming out of the financial crisis. And that took a few years to happen. But there was, you know, going at the end of the 20th century, there was this conversation around, oh, we actually need to pre-fund these plans that we set up in the early part of the 20th century. And that conversation matured and got to the point where most states were like, yeah, we need to pre-fund these things. And then there was a change in you know, broader specters around financial markets, sort of starting with the dot-com bubble, but then certainly on the back end of the financial crisis. And so then there's a whole other aspect of different perspectives of what kind of investment returns we could get, what the cost of these plans are. And then over the decade between 2009 and say 2019, a sort of steady realization that, hey, these things that we created in the 20th century, they're going to cost a lot more than what we thought that they were going to cost. And we got to get serious about what it means to fund these things. Good and analysis then, in uh, a community of analysts. Thank you. Uh, Vedanta, was it mostly or not only for sure investment returns? Uh, I think uh, investment, I think depends, right? I guess some of the larger funds which are better funded, I think they're not as reliant on uh, the investment returns. They have a higher proportion of assets in fixed income and so not then just, they're not as not. reliant. But right. when you're looking at some of the lower funded states, I mean, you're seeing a more pronounced shift towards alternative assets and just in general riskier assets. So it's probably for them more reliant on well, that's some of the kind investment. Of mixed, mixed, good or bad. Merrill, is it intentional and good, good governance on the parts of states? Is that really a, a, a big part of what we see? I think basically, I think that's a, that's one way to uh, respond to that question, and that is, and I think the point I tried to make was the fact that at, at the state government level, and if you're dealing with budgets or you're dealing with pensions, there are always issues to face. You have to deal with economic fluctuations, and you have to think in terms of the short term as well as the long term. And I think those issues are just become front and center as a result of the certain de decline in the funding ratio of pensions. Yeah. And, and your work has helped. And, and I, I would be remiss not to say VOCR itself, the VOCR Alliance has been important in putting right. uh, uh, focus on these issues and bringing us greater transparency. And uh, Les, do you think it's holding feet to the fire as your insurance industry perhaps does to some degree, market forces? Um, <clears throat> or not? You know, I, what I was really going to say when you posed the question, Susan, was... That, and some of the other panelists have talked about this is, um, I think that uh, there's, I've definitely detected a, uh, an improvement in what the contributions that are going in are doing to pay down unfunded liabilities. Yes, there are, there are instances where there's, the contributions are not high enough, uh, but you know, combined with a fairly decent uh, investment performance against actuarial assumptions and improved funding, um, I think those have contributed to the overall uh, improvement. And Susan, can I just yes, jump, jump in for a second? You know, okay. And thank you for the nice words about that. Uh, we've always, in, in our state budget grades, we, we've always uh, used uh, uh, pension contributions or not making your actuarial pension contribution as as one of the markers for a, for, for a grade. But, but the fact is also that that states and many cities had more money uh, back just after the last recession. State and local revenue just fell off the map, and Congress didn't didn't come back and didn't really come in and and stop them out the way they did during COVID. So you had an eleven year economic recovery. Uh, state and state and local revenues were very very strong. Unemployment was down to three percent. The bottom fell out briefly. And then Congress comes in and and stuffs five trillion dollars into into the economy, which paid off in in tax revenue. Oh, right. So for the first time in in many years, uh, states didn't have to make the the, the decision between uh, a highway or a new school building uh, or uh, or hiring cops uh, or paint or or paying off pension debt. And well said. Well that was said, that, that was that was a big deal. Well said. I, I can, have a lightning I, round question, but I know we want to get some questions. Yeah, I, I want to get. I want to just get back to the the, the risk question, um, and I want to perhaps start with with, with, with Shoaib. Uh, you talked a little bit about about New Jersey strategy, and I'd like to hear from from Merle also about Kentucky, your 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 board member hat. Um, 
number one, I can, you know, I I can get five and a half percent now on a on a bank CD uh, without without any trouble and without a lot of brain work. So, what's going on in New Jersey? How are you? What are you selling to to buy that to to buy that 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 fixed income? What what does it mean? And then the second question uh, for everybody really is uh, private equity. Private uh, private credit, which is loans, non bank loans, um, you know, a lot of a lot of private equity goes into real estate. Commercial real estate has not been the has, has not been the quietest field right now, especially office real estate. So what what's go, what's going on, uh, and what kind of risks are, are are funds taking in these two areas? And, and Bill, if I may, just put a point on that real estate. The real estate has not recognized the losses REIT markets show at all. Of course, the REITs could be also. Uh, pricing and distress. It doesn't happen, but it certainly we see the broadest difference in valuations at, uh, for decades. So, uh, yeah. Good point. That, that's a good question, Bill. I think there are a couple of issues that the states face and pension managers face, and that is to make, it's not easy to make quick adjustments. For example, if the increase in interest rates has been rel relatively rapid, and it certainly does affect one's outlook in terms of asset allocation. But you also have to think in terms of how long will the increased interest rates survive or will the Fed begin to adjust those interest rates? And if you begin to make adjustments in your portfolio in anticipation of a longer term status of high interest rates, that could have some impact on the future uh, condition of your, of your portfolio as well. So it's, it's the unknown of the future, which becomes a big factor in, in your decision process. So we, we try to be very careful with our asset allocation policy. And to look at it in terms of long term, but also if we, there are some short term adjustments that can be made, we can make those. But let's look at it in terms of long term, because that's the future of pension funds. It's a long term process, and we simply need to manage those funds relative to long term liabilities. And, and that's uh, that's a that's a difficult and challenging process, and and, and we, we try to approach it that way. And I think Marla, I think yeah. you bring up. Sure, please important. go ahead. Thank you, Bill. I think you bring up an important point there. It is about long-term investing because that is obviously the objective here. Without a doubt, 5.5% is great, but that's not going to continue in the future. I think New Jersey uh, is, is fortunate in that it's not having to sell anything in order to increase our allocations to private. And the reason being is because when you look across our private asset allocations, we're underweight each and every of, uh, of those asset classes. So it's a matter of, of over time, and that doesn't mean by the end of next year or any, any target date, but over time when it makes the sense to do it, and vintage diversification is very important. As you mentioned, Susan, there, there's a fair amount of valuation changes which may need to be recognized going forward. So being under uh, allocated, and having the cash available to deploy in a market Important. that is adjusting valuations in, 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 in the future will, I think, position New Jersey very well to do that. And that's how we're approaching it without putting any, any deadlines or dates on when we need to increase those allocations. We're under it. Real estate, obviously, is, is, is something that's mentioned. We're about five and change percent allocation to real estate where the target is eight, long-term target is 8%. So we've got a fair amount of way to go. In addition to that, office uh, obviously and retail has been negatively impacted, adversely impacted, but we are light, we, we have lighter allocations, uh, lower allocations to those and where, where we are allocating tends to be more towards logistics and healthcare and, 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 and areas which are, 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 you know, looking brighter in the future. Attention to- How about uh, your equity well, allocation? Have, are, are you- above or, or below where we, we've had a big run in the stock market, obviously. Yeah, it, it, it is something that we watch very carefully. I would say that within public equities and public fixed income, we're slightly below depending on where, where, where you know, which week and which week, because obviously markets are very volatile, but we're more or less closer to target in those public uh, security areas because there's a fair amount of liquidity and we have the ability for tactical allocations far better there than we do within private market assets. Bill, I have a lightning round question. May I go with it? Absolutely. And, that, and that'll probably take us to the everybody. top of the hour. We're at 75, 78%. Is this the peak of funding or is it going to get better or are we at the best it's going to be? Yes or no? Let's start with Joab. Yes or no? Are we going to get better or are we at the best point? I, I believe it'll be volatile, but I think over time it gets better. Better. Okay. I'm hopeful. Anthony? 
it's going to get better, but it's going to require contribution rates to grow above the current 30% of payroll average in order for that to happen. I mean, I don't think it's going to get better, I, at least in the next medium, short to medium term, but hopefully in the long term with prudent policy, it you know, you know, proves me wrong. Positive for long term, but not so much now. Merle? I think it's an in incremental process. I mean, in fact, you, you can't increase the ratio but very quickly. Attention. And Thank so you, you have to do it in a deliberate fashion with uh, good management decisions. Which, yes, Les? Uh, I think that in some cases it's going to get worse before it gets better, but overall it'll probably get better. Heterogeneous. Wrap us up, Liz. I think there are always some places that aren't going to make their payments. So I'm I'm with Vedanta and it's uh, this is the best we'll see for a while. <laughs> okay, back to you. Okay, Mark. so we're thinking about putting a yellow flag up on the beach, uh, but maybe not, not, not quite yet. We're sort of Stripe green and yellow, and and that'll do it for 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 this uh, for this special briefing. Uh, my colleagues will put up a little information slide. If uh, if you want to contact any of the panelists, uh, their emails are up here, uh, or come back and uh, and watch the archive version of this to, uh, to to copy it down, or get in touch with us, and we'll we'll put you in touch with the panelists. Thank you so much to Susan Walker to our panelists, great panelists, and to you, our terrific audience, for joining Special Briefing today. We'll be back in January, so watch our websites and your email for details. Thanks also to the Volcker Alliance, members of the Penn IUR Board of Advisors, and the Century Foundation, and special thanks to the folks behind the mic, Graham Dowd, Noah Wynn Ritzenberg, Arden Jordan, and Diana Lynn. Uh, if I miss anybody uh, on that list, it's my bad. Remember to catch up on this and all of our other special briefings on our podcast and have a great holiday uh, wherever you're celebrating and whatever you're celebrating. So for now, I'm Bill Glasgow with Susan Walker, and we'll see you again in January. Thank you so much.